Pick up a lesson there if you haven't already gotten one. Lesson three. Okay, we got uh, about 148 slides. That's not as many as I had last week, so maybe we can go okay. You don't need to read out that slide, but I thought it was interesting that the name Galilee really means good or desirable. And of course, Galilee is the home area of Jesus. And he spent a lot of time there. Uh, although we think of the time he spent at Jerusalem as important. There were lots of things that he did, lots of miracles he performed in Galilee. And we'll be talking about that in the next two weeks. Okay, here's a picture of the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And that moved down for some reason. So uh, you don't see all of the road, but it's about, uh, it's about 20 miles. But it's really rough road. But uh, this is a relief map, so you can actually see all the mountains. See the mountains, and the, it says J Judean hills, but that's really Samaritan hills uh, between Jerusalem and Nazareth. And so this map will show you that there are really three routes to get there. The green route, which is in the middle, is the fastest route, but it goes through Samaria, and most Jews didn't want to travel through Samaria. Although we're told in John 4 that Jesus did. But of course, he had an appointment to meet with the lady there at the well. Most people went the regular road, which is here from Jerusalem. They went that way. Uh, and that's the way we travel there when we were in a bus. But there is an alternate route, and lots of people took it in Jesus' time. And that is to go to Jericho cross the Jordan River, and then go up to the Sea of Galilee and over to Nazareth. So before you saw the rugged territory going down to Jerusalem, well, or going down to Jericho from Jerusalem. Oh, by the way, record if you haven't done that, would you please? Okay, thank you. The topography going the other way, going back west, is uh, considerably different. You can see there's lots of trees and vegetation and so forth. And so I just wanted to show you that uh, we're moving through a different countryside than that barren land going down to Jericho that we saw last week. And uh, this is just a little village we passed. Donna likes to take pictures out the bus window. She does a pretty good job of doing that. But everywhere you go, there are mosques. There are more mosques than there are churches uh, in, in uh, Israel. I'm sorry to say. But uh, after a little while, we started to see this mountain. And I had looked at the shape before because that just happens to be a mountain that uh, I think a lot about because it's <laughs> Mount Tabor. And since my last name is Tabor, spelled the same way, when we could see Mount Tabor, well, Donna, she probably took 20 pictures and I haven't put them all up here. But we could see Mount Tabor in the distance. But we're headed for Nazareth and we won't go to Mount Tabor until the next day. But there's another picture of it. But you see the flat farmland around there. There's, uh, there's lots of good tillable land and it's quite fertile, I'm told. So there were just some quick pictures of Mount Tabor. So we're getting close now to Nazareth. And our guide was telling us now we're going to cross through the mountain to get to Nazareth. You used to have to go around and go over the mountain, but now you go through the tunnels and the highway there. And so we saw that coming up. We're going to come back to this in a minute because there's some significance to this area right here. But I'll tell you about that a little later. So there we are. It's, it's, uh, I think there were three lanes or four in each one, three, I think. So that's six lanes through the mountain, but it's not very far. And you come out on the other side, and there's Nazareth. Now, maybe you didn't know, but you may have looked at the outline to see. Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament at all. Because it wasn't very important. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' time, just about the turn of the A.D., it was only about 2,000 people. It was a small village. And everybody knew everybody, I'm told. So Joseph was well known there. 
And Mary and later Jesus, as they lived there, would have been known by all the people in Nazareth more than likely. I thought that's interesting. Mount Tabor's in the background, though. Doesn't look very far away, although it takes a while to get there. But uh, we went to a hotel, which was quite nice. And the reason I put it there is because we were up on about uh, the seventh floor. And that was a great place to be because we had a balcony that we could look out. And there was the uh, moon, or maybe that was the sun. I can't remember now. That's the moon. Okay. And it was just about dark when we got there and we were happy to see the moon over the city of Nazareth. Hmm. No, but was a I'm sorry, it maybe was it was a sunset. sunset, maybe so. Okay, in any event, we hadn't had any trouble for the time we'd been in, in uh, Israel and uh, Jordan for a, a week and a half. We hadn't had any trouble, but all of a sudden there were gunshots. At least I thought they were. <laughs> and I wanted to get down on the floor yeah. and Donna went over to the window and I was saying, don't go to the window. She looked out and she said, it's fireworks. <laughs> and so she took a picture to prove to me that it's fireworks. I still wasn't looking for a while. She took several pictures. The thing is, it was June the 2nd. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there was anything to celebrate. We asked later and they said, oh, it's probably a wedding. But boy, they lit up the whole area. And it did sound like gunshots. It was boom, 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 boom. I've heard gunshots before and that's what I thought it was. But I was relieved that it was fireworks instead. So just a few, we could actually tell where they were coming from, which was just down on the sidewalk. So I'm not really sure whether it's a wedding or a celebration of some kind that Nobody knew about, but the whole neighborhood knew that they were celebrating something. Okay. Now we're moving to a church. And you've already seen a number of churches as we looked in Jerusalem and then we went to, to uh, Bethlehem. Does anybody know what this church would be in that particular place for? We're talking about Nazareth. So why would this church be there? And I don't know whether you can read any of that. I can't, but there are a number of figures and I'll show you some more pictures of that in a minute. But what's this church all about? Well, when you see the name, you'll know. But I thought maybe somebody would make a guess. Of course, if you're wrong, I'll just say, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're probably embarrassed to say anything. Well, that's Mary on the right. and. Uh, that may be an angel on the left, Gabriel. Does that tell you anything? Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a child as a virgin. And she was to name that child Jesus and he was to become the king of Israel. So I've already given it away before we got to the name, haven't I? Also down in the middle, if I can show you right there, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, although they're spelling their names different, uh, I'm not sure what language that is, but uh, there's a reason that they have those up there too. There you can see them better. Matthew Vez and Mark Vez and Luke Vez and Jonas. Well, that's the four books of the Bible. Now, look there. You've seen that before. I showed you before. That's what's known as the Jerusalem cross. And I had never seen one until we got to the Holy Land, but it's one big cross with four smaller crosses. And I told you some said that was the wounds in Jesus, but he had five wounds, not four. He had one in each foot and one on each hand. That's four, but he has sideless pierced. That's five. They suggest, and I'd read this elsewhere, that the four crosses represent the four gospels that tell about Jesus. And that's why we saw Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so in any event, it's very interesting, but I didn't take pictures of everything there. They had probably 25 or 30 cities uh, or I should say countries 
which depicted Mary and Gabriel or Mary and the baby Jesus. And so this says it's the Philippines. And you'll see in a minute, there's one that's from the Far East. And it's interesting what they did with the picture. Getting ahead of myself. But you see Basilica of the Annunciation. So this is called the Church of the Annunciation. And there's actually a sign that says, this is a Catholic church. So please, ladies, you're not to have your shoulders exposed or your knees. Uh, and we would prefer you to wear something on your head when you go in. So that's just a statue in the courtyard of Mary. And somebody's put something on there to celebrate that. The, the uh, door has lots of... Uh, Scenes Jesus on the cross, but down here I think is Jesus when he was 12 in the temple. And to the right is, uh, let's see, I figured it out once. Uh, oh, it's Jesus being baptized. And then uh, just above that is Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. You can see the ship in the, in the background. And uh, this is Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem. So I don't know what all these mean necessarily, but Somebody put those there because they wanted to remember lots of things that Jesus did. Now we get inside the Church of the Annunciation, and this is why it's built where it is. You see, that's where the so-called altar would be. But if you look behind, there's rock, and you're looking into a cave. And uh, as we move up, you see there's the Jerusalem cross again on the gates. But we're looking through to what I guess is the, the main altar. But this tells about uh, Luke 1, 26, uh, Mary being uh, approached by Gabriel. And there's what they call the altar, I guess. And in that cave, that's supposedly where Mary was when uh, Gabriel appeared to her. Now, lots of things happen in caves, and I don't have an explanation for that, but we've seen caves in Egypt where Jesus supposedly lived with his family when he went there. We've seen caves uh, down in Judah uh, in, in several places, and you're going to see more caves. John, uh, uh, that wrote Revelation, probably wrote it in a cave, and we'll see that here in a few weeks. What is that blue stuff? Well, that's just a covering that they have, and I can't tell you what's written on there. It's not in the language I understand, but it's to celebrate that this is where Mary heard that she was going to be the mother of Jesus. Now, you have to remember that the Catholics take this a lot further, and they think Mary, the mother of God, as they call her, it has some deity as well, that she somehow was more than just a woman. That's not what the scriptures seem to say, but that's what some Catholics believe. And so they worship and pray to Mary often. Whoops, sorry, I went twice. There is uh, Japan, and I want you to just notice. Does that look like Mary and Jesus as you would recognize them? Well, they're Oriental. And that's because some countries said, we want to represent Jesus and his mother as being like us because Jesus came to earth for all of us. And so I thought that was really interesting that they would represent uh, the family that way. Okay, we're in another place now. We left the church. And I know this doesn't look like much. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a roadway over the top and there were some buildings over the top, but we were looking down into a cave area and Scholars tell us that this was very likely, if not the spot, within a few feet of the spot that Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, if you will, had his workshop. And his workshop was probably in a cave. So where would Jesus have worked? In that cave, more than likely, for at least much of his life uh, until he was age 30. And so that's just another picture of the area. Uh, I don't know where they come up with the idea, well, this is the place, but apparently 
Nazareth was small enough that they could kind of zero in on where Joseph's shop probably would have been. Okay, so you remember the story, and we're not going to go into great detail, but how was it that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? And that's what the scriptures had actually predicted, that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. And yet Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth. Well, it's because Joseph needed to go to Bethlehem to pay taxes. And so they went from Galilee to Bethlehem. And we've already seen the story of where Jesus was probably born uh, there in that cave, which was uh, outside a, a home. Instead of being an inn, it was probably more like a, uh, uh, it wasn't a guest house either. It was the barn for a family home where they would have stayed, except it was full. Other family members got there early, so there was no room in the family home. Okay, and so after they went to Egypt and were skipping over some, some time, it says they settled in the city of Nazareth. And so Jesus, from that point forward, was referred to often as the Nazarene. It says the prophets would be fulfilled. It actually never calls him a Nazarene in any of the Old Testament. But it does say that he's going to be rejected by people because they say he's nobody. He's, he's from Nazareth. He's a Nazarene. And you'll see that they look down on Nazarenes because there wasn't anything in Nazareth to make it important. Okay, I just skipped one scripture, didn't I? So you remember the story of Philip finding Nathaniel and it said, we found the person that you've read about in the Old Testament and Moses who wrote the law wrote about, and he's Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And what was Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And what Philip say? He didn't argue with him. He just said, come and see and, of course, we know that Nathaniel was convinced as well, because you remember that story? Jesus knew exactly when Philip had talked to Nathaniel, and he later told Nathaniel, I know where you were when you heard to come here. You were standing under the fig tree. And Nathaniel said, you are truly God, the Messiah. Okay, in Luke, the fourth chapter, this tells us about a time early in Jesus' ministry. More than likely, this is further down. He had already performed his first miracle, which was where, by the way? Cana of Galilee, where he performed uh, the turning of water to wine at the wedding. And Cana is just north of Nazareth a little ways. And he had probably already gone up to Capernaum and uh, done miracles up there, too. But he came back to Nazareth. And it said that he went to the synagogue. And he stood up to read. A man could do that. And they were handed a scroll and they didn't pick the place. It was picked where they were supposed to start reading. And so the story is miraculous because God planned this all out. He started reading in Isaiah where it talked about, is in Isaiah 61, about uh, the Messiah coming. And that didn't upset the people so much. They thought he spoke wonderfully, and they said, isn't this Joseph, the son of the carpenter? But when they got upset was when Jesus went on to say that just like other occasions, God was going to do good to people other than the Jews. And boy, did that make them mad, because they thought they were God's people, and they didn't want anybody else receiving any goodness from God. And so what did they do at that point? They got up to drive him out of the city, and they actually brought him to the crest of the hill on which their city was built so they could throw him down from the cliff. But he passed through their midst and went on his way. We don't know how that happened for sure, but they thought they had a hold of him. They were going to push him off the cliff, and then he just wasn't there any longer. He walked away. Well, I told you we'd get back to that in a minute. Guess where that was? You remember when we saw... That hill, you know what that's called? It's called Mount Precipice. The precipice that they were going to throw Jesus off. 
And so it was right up there. So we didn't know when we were seeing something very interesting until later. Okay, now we're going to a place that you've never heard of probably, but it's only about three miles from Nazareth. It's less than five kilometers, so it's about three miles, and that's called Zippori. It's also called Sephoris. If you see on your outline there, they often call cities several different names. You try to keep them straight. This had actually been the capital of Galilee for part of the time that Jesus lived in Nazareth until 25 AD. And at that point, they moved the capital to Tiberias, which is over on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. We'll see next week. But uh, this was Herod Antipas's capital. But there had already been an improvement project started while it was still the capital. It started sometime before 25 AD. Jesus would have probably been working already by that time as a carpenter. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But in any event, this is what's left of the city. And we'll move pretty quickly through that. They have some wonderful murals on floors that would have been in buildings. And I want you to pay attention to something. There's a picture of a lady there and you can see people in the background. Well, that looks like a photograph to me in many ways. I mean, you can tell that that's a lady and she was a beautiful lady. Remember that in a little while when I show you some more pictures on the floor of something. Okay. I keep setting you up for things. <laughs> in any event, the fortress of Zipporah is because it was also a Roman stronghold, even though it was the capital of Herod Antipas's uh Galilee the Romans were there and this was a Roman colony if you will and there was their fort and it was right on top of the hill so that they could see everything that's pretty common and also they had this amphitheater because Roman soldiers like to have their fun and part of their fun was to watch gladiators fight one another or fight wild animals so that was uh Zipporah now I am told by experts, and I'm surely not an expert, that the word carpenter in the Jewish language could mean a stonemason as well as a person who worked with wood. I hadn't heard that before. But most of the building that they did in the area, the walls were made out of stone. It was the roofs that were covered with wood or thatch. But the walls were stone, so Jesus may have been a stonemason with his father. We don't know that for sure. But many scholars believe that Joseph and Jesus probably came to Zipporah to work because there was lots of work there. They were doing lots of things with stone. Maybe so, maybe not. But it was only a few miles away. All right. Can somebody read what that says? It's a little bit hard to see, isn't it? Something Carmelite order. Okay, Carmelite. Well, that sounds like something good to eat, Carmel, right? <laughs> Mount Carmel is not something to eat. Do you remember what happened on Mount Carmel? I'm sorry? But that's where Elijah encountered the prophets of Baal was on Mount Carmel. And he felt like he was pretty much alone. But uh, he, he tried to convince the people, look, you either choose. I guess I ought to get to that scripture in a minute. But that also says that that's the Carmelite order. And it says it's a Catholic church. And again, they wanted you to dress accordingly if you went inside. But here's the passage I was talking about. So uh, we're not covering all of this. I'm going to just summarize it. Elijah asked the people, how are you going to struggle with the two choices? Either the Lord's God and you follow him or you follow Baal, one or the other. Make a choice. They wouldn't make a choice. God told Elijah, you have these prophets of Baal. Put an animal, a pig. I don't know whether it's a pig or not. That I don't know why I said that. Put an animal on 
the altar. And uh, then you ask Baal to burn it as an offering. And so they put him there and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and nothing ever happened. Elijah did the same thing, only with his offering, he had him pour water all over it. There was water standing on it, water in a trough around the bottom. And yet when the time came, in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. It licked up the water that's in the trench. And finally, people said, okay, we're going to believe in God. And even though Elijah had previously felt that uh, he was the only one around and there were 450 prophets of Baal, you see in verse 37. Well, actually, that's verse 22, I guess. God took care of it. And so after this, Elijah said, kill the prophets of Baal, and they killed them all. So God was glorified. Wonderful story. Well, there's a depiction. That is not a pig on there, but that's what stuck in my mind a minute ago. They wouldn't have offered a pig, so excuse me for that foul up. But you see, there's an animal, and they're praying that Baal will light the fire there, and that doesn't happen. And so after... God consumed Elijah's sacrifice. Then he told them to kill the prophets of Baal, and they did so, and that's what's depicted there. You're up on top of a mountain, and I guess you can see the Mediterranean, although I think that was the other side, and we didn't actually see that. But you can look out on the farmland below, and it's quite a view there. We have a couple of uh, views of different places there. See, we're on Mount Carmel, and we're looking down. We're over by the Mediterranean. We went about 40 miles from Nazareth over to the Mediterranean to go up Mount Carmel. And there is a statue recognizing Elijah. Okay, we're headed somewhere else now. And Donna, as I said, she likes to sit by the window and she likes to take pictures. And so she sees things coming up that I don't have any idea it's coming up because I'm not looking out the window like she is. And you see that round stone and then there's a hole there? I have tried to find out what this was and nobody can tell me for sure. They said it appears to be a tomb that's no longer used, okay? I kind of figured that out maybe. Nobody in it and the stones rolled away, but I just thought it was interesting. So we took a couple of pictures, but you won't find anybody describing that anywhere that I could find. And we are on our way to Megiddo. You remember when we were uh, looking last week, it talked about different tells, and the tell was a mound, and the mound was made by building one civilization on top of another. And Megiddo was one of those that was mentioned because it is quite famous. If you'll notice on the outline, it says that there are 22 levels of occupation in Megiddo, meaning 22 different layers of people, and we're headed there. Although, this talks about how important and significant it is in history. Yes, it's a bunch of ruins. And sometimes I don't have the imagination that I need to have. But I'm showing it to you and maybe you have that imagination. So one thing that happened, and it's sad, but you remember King Josiah? He's the one that the law book was found. And Josiah said it's been lost. And now we're going to implement the law again. Josiah was a good king, but Josiah died because he thought that uh, he could fight the enemy. I don't know whether he believed God would save him, but in any event, he was urged not to go uh, there to Megiddo, but he went, and it says that Pharaoh Necho saw him and killed him. So that's where he died. There's a relief map of the area. It's quite voluminous really it's lots to see and we move through it pretty quickly but you see those stones if jesus went to megiddo and he probably did at some point he probably walked on some of those stones because they're they're there from the first century so we had uh, 52 people in our group and uh, sometimes you take a picture of the scenery and there's some group members in there 
but there are lots of uh, things that probably have lots of archaeological value that I didn't recognize. They did tell us that uh, they had a wonderful water system, so we took some pictures of some pits that had a uh, place where they would catch water, and then they dispersed it through tunnels. And there's another place that would be a cistern that would hold water, because they're in a fairly arid area, although there's some farmland around there, but they don't get as much rain as they would need for a city. So they kept the water. Now, in the background is Mount Tabor. How about that? <laughs> so we're headed in that direction, but uh, there it is. Okay, so you can see there's a building up on top there, and that's where we're headed, to that building. That's called the Church of Transfiguration. And you remember the story. Jesus went up on a mountain. Now, it may have been Mount Tabor. That's what most scholars now say. But other scholars say, no, it was probably Mount Hermon, which is a taller mountain. And it's further north of Galilee. It's way north of the, the Sea of Galilee. And we'll see that on a map later. But in any event, Jesus took three disciples up on a mountain and his face began, began to glow, and then two people appeared, Moses and Elijah. I may have said this before, so I'm sorry to repeat it, but, you know, I was always kind of sad that Moses was not permitted to go to the promised land because he had sinned. He had been presumptuous and struck a rock and says, I command water to come out instead of asking God to do it. And so God said, you're not going to the Holy Land, but stop. Where are they now? They're in the Holy Land. And Moses is there. Okay, so I th he got to come, but later. All right? But in any event, you know, Peter, Peter didn't know what else to say, so he just said, let's, let's build a tabernacle for each of these three men. And, of course, that was the wrong thing to say. The voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And so they didn't build three <clears throat> tabernacles. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the way we had to get there, the bus couldn't drive up the winding road. It's too winding, the regular bus. So we had to take these small vans to get to the top. And it was quite a ride, actually. Lots of hairpin turns. Uh, there's a picture of somebody driving, and we're all holding our breath. <laughs> but there's the church of the Transfiguration, as it's called. And it's not the biggest church in the world, but it's there to remember Jesus being transfigured. And you see his apostles and you also see Moses and Elijah. But here's the disappointing thing to me. This is the main area of the church, but off to the side, and we're gonna get there in a minute, there's a little chapel, and that's Moses' chapel. So that sounds like they're building a tabernacle for Moses there after the scriptures say, no, don't do that. But they've done it here. A little presumptuous, I thought. And there's the one for Elijah. So why people would go against what the scripture said and even remember them, I don't know. They just wanted to remember that event, I guess. Okay, so we went outside, and since this is Mount Tabor, there was not a sign anywhere that said Mount Tabor for me to stand by. So there I am on the patio, and we're looking out. It has a great view as well. And you look across the farmland down there in the mountains, and that's the view from Mount Tabor. You can actually see 360 degrees from the top of the mountain as you walk away. There's lots of gardens and so forth there, and it's a pretty peaceful place in many ways. Okay, it's Sunday morning, and we're staying in a hotel in Nazareth, and we go to the Church of Christ in Nazareth. The preacher there was an accountant for many years, but the Israeli government changed the rules and said, you can't have missionaries from foreign countries come in. You have to have missionaries from Israel. And they didn't have a preacher from Israel. 
So he went to the Sunset School of Preaching and graduated and came back and has been a preacher for 25 years now. His children have both gone to free to Hardeman uh, to uh, school as well. The church does get some support, but it's a pretty vibrant church. Now, there were 52 of us, and so we met a big crowd, but they had other people there too. The strange thing is they're not Jewish people. They're Arab people. The whole group is Arab. Arab people are much more receptive to the gospel than Jewish people are. There are Jews in Nazareth, but there aren't any at this congregation. So it's just like lots of church buildings you've been in before. The Churches of Christ salutes you. And there we are. They have the PowerPoint on the, the front there. And uh, there's our guide, Everett Hufford, who some of you have met before because he's preached here before. Uh, and a number of our group. There's the songbook. The songbook has the words and the music in English, and on the other side, it has the words in Arabic. And they sometimes sing in Arabic, too. I think some of them sing Arabic even when you're singing English. And so they decided to hold a potluck for us, Churches of Christ and potlucks. And there's the ladies that are fixing the meal although we reimburse them for the food because they they need that. When you're serving 52 people, you know, you need some help. And so they had a nice covered patio and we got to fellowship while we were waiting for the meal to be prepared. We went inside and it was a first class meal. Very good. Uh, there's our hotel. I didn't realize how close we were, but it's only a couple blocks over there. You can see it up at the top. And there's the sign that says Church of Christ, an arrow pointing over there. So we had a good worship service with them on Sunday. And now we're headed out. And if you're looking at the outline, it says this is the Jezreel Plain. Well, maybe you've not heard of the Valley of Jezreel, but it's a famous valley in Galilee. And it runs basically uh, west to east or east to west. And it goes across Galilee just above some mountains and just below other mountains. It's south of Mount Tabor, but it's north of other mountains. And it's very, very fertile farmland. And so, well, I took this because it says Megiddo down there, and we've been to Megiddo and that circle. The reason I wanted you to see that is it says the plain of Jezreel there, just above Megiddo, and that extends all the way over to the Jordan River south of Mount Tabor, and we're going to see it again in a moment. But it's a famous valley, and lots of people move there. So I know Jesus moved along here, too. Just some farmland. Okay, now we're to a synagogue, or what used to be a synagogue. And there's what it probably looked like as somebody's reconstructed it. And somebody even did a drawing to say, well, it probably looked like this. But this is really strange. This is Beth Alpha Synagogue. It was a Jewish synagogue. But look what's on the floor. It's an astrological diagram. Astrology. Jews didn't believe in astrology. Jesus told them, you know, you don't believe in those kinds of things. Get rid of that stuff that you have and they... They burned books and so forth that they had about astrology. But for some reason, somebody there, maybe it was the church leaders in that area, they just said, we're going to be different. We want somebody to come in and draw this on our floor. I'm glad the floor's still there where we can see it. But you remember when I told you that one picture looked like a real picture and I wanted you to think of what doesn't. Look at that. That looks like some kid drew that to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that person was all that talented. They're drawing pictures of lions up there at the top. Those are lions and pictures of people that look like cartoon characters. I wasn't impressed. Maybe I was just trying to find fault. Anyway, there's another picture and you can see again the people why did they need this and what does it represent? I can't tell you. I don't know of any Jewish religious practice 
they would say, we need to have this and we need to refer to it. But there it is. And there's some other pictures of lions that I said. So, okay, so we saw that. I'm glad I saw it to know that it could happen. Just think of the repercussions of that. People can do all kinds of things to say this is something religious that we want to worship or mean something to us that doesn't mean anything. I think we need to be careful about lots of things that people might bring in and say, let's put that on the wall because that might have some meaning. Okay, we're moving on. And if you got a, picture, uh, a copy of Lesson 3 last week, I apologize that I misspelled Nazareth twice. So Nazareth is spelled N-A-Z-A-R-E-T-H, and I've corrected that on the handout you got for tonight. And also, when you get down to the mountain, I said Mount Gibbon, and it's Mount Gilboa. I couldn't read my own writing, apparently, and I apologize for that. So it's Gilboa, and we're not looking at Mount Tabor there. We're looking at Mount Gilboa, and it looks a little bit like Mount Tabor, but it's not as wide as Mount Tabor. And there's something on the top, and I can't tell you what that is, but you've heard of Mount Gilboa before if you've read through the scriptures. And there is where it is. And uh, Nazareth would be to the north of that. And Mount Tabor would be to the north. There's Nazareth quite a ways up there. We're coming across the Jezreel Plain that I told you about. Okay, so Mount Gilboa. Well, sad thing that happened here. King Saul and his three sons, which included Jonathan. You remember Jonathan was a great friend of David. They all died on Mount Gilboa. They were slain by the Philistines. And uh, Saul died with his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on that day. And the next day, when the Philistines came to strip those that killed, they found Saul, Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they just had to make a big deal out of it because we kill the Israeli king and his family so that's looking at Mount Gilboa and now we're moving to a place called Bet Shein there's it's spelled different ways too but Bet or Bet Shein is a national park and that's where they brought the bodies and they nailed their bodies to a wall on a mountain There's the city. It was quite a city. It was a Roman city. There were Roman guards there, and there were Colosseums. There's the mountain, and I did not walk up all those steps. We didn't have time, actually. I think a few of our group did, but they had to go up and come down quickly. But the area where the bodies were nailed was on the other side of that mountain, I'm told. And so we see later what happened after bodies were put there in first samuel 31 it says all the valiant men when they heard about this got up and walked all night and took the body of saul and the bodies of the son from the wall at best chan as it's called there and they came to jabish and they burned them there so a sad story the king dying the regime having to change at the hand of a well-known enemy, the Philistines. Okay, I'm just going to show you some more. There are actually lots of ruins here, and you can see the columns. They had lots of big buildings, and uh, over to the right is the entrance into the Colosseum, and so again, they had their entertainment there, and yet that still exists, so it's pretty old. So we walked around quite a bit, the streets long, and you see lots of columns there. But they had a terrible earthquake there that really destroyed the city. And uh, it's interesting. We're told that you can tell this was an earthquake that destroyed this and not somebody coming in and knocking it down like an army. The way you can tell is you can look at all of the pillars that are laying on the ground. They all feel the same way. And that's because of the earthquake knocking them over. 
At least that's what they tell me. I probably wouldn't have figured that out. We're not going to take the time to read all those things, but it talked about their bathhouse. And it was a big heated swimming pool, but it also was a sauna. And uh, it was a place to just come and relax. And the Romans allowed others to come there. So the Jewish people that lived there were probably allowed to go here. There were some of their bath and toilet accessories. And it says uh, there's, uh, well, it's hard to read that down there, but it says there's some other things for personal hygiene, which includes, I can't read it from here, but an ear pig. And so all of you have your ear picks, right? And you use those all the time. <laughs> Most of you use a Kleenex or Q-tip probably. But they had ear picks as well as these things were to scrape your body. That looks like it's a little rough to me. These other containers were to hold oil that you would pour on yourself. But that was interesting, I thought. And there is uh, where their heated area was. All those columns are hollow and they pumped hot air into those columns and it came up. And so they had a floor on top of this and the floor was heated. I told you about a heated floor before when we looked uh, at Masada last week. But uh, this was a large area, and that was their heated area. And they could take saunas there. And then there's the bathhouse toilet. Some of you have seen this kind of stuff before. I think we had some ladies that went to Greece uh, on Let's Start Talking a few years ago. And in Greece, they saw some of the toilets. They were community places. No, they weren't mixed sex. It was mainly men there. They may have had some places for women, but basically you go to the toilet and you spend time talking with people sitting around next to you. And so it's quite the, quite the place. And you might stay there for a long time. And they have water running under. And so it was hygienic, if you will. But that was their bathhouse. And there's there's a picture of it too with the troughs below where the water was running. Did I want to gross you out? Not particularly, but I did want you to see what it was like. Okay, we're looking back up that hill and we're looking at some of the columns. There are also some, some ruins up on the top, I'm told, but we're leaving there now. We're in the Jezreel Valley again and we're headed east toward the Jordan. And you can see that it's very fertile there. Lots of cropland. We get to the Jordan River. And we come to a place that's called Yardinette. And they say the baptismal site on the Jordan River. Now, I would beg to differ, and I already mentioned this before. You remember last week we looked at the Israeli Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea. And I said, we're also going to see it again when we go over to Jordan, when we go to Petra, and that's going to be in two weeks. And we stopped at the site on the Jordan side, which is probably where John was actually baptizing people. And we looked at a passage of scripture that talked about Jesus arriving from Galilee. Well, how could he arrive from Galilee if he's still in Galilee? And I did some research, and this Yardinette was actually not developed until 1981. That's just, just a few years ago, yeah. 40 years ago. Why? Because they had all this trouble at the West Bank, and you couldn't get to the Jordan River by the Dead Sea, and they wanted tourists, so they just came up with another place. And so here it is. Now, it's actually privately owned. And uh, that was just another passage that said he came from Nazareth to Galilee. Now, we're going to talk about this more later. Don, you asked last week, does that mean that Jesus came directly there from Galilee? Well, it's interesting. Uh, when we're talking about the place uh, down by the Dead Sea that Jesus probably was baptized at, it was uh, about 90 miles a little less than 90 miles, and one could reach it from Nazareth in two days. It'd be two hard days. 
they say three days would be the normal journey time. But uh, more than likely, Jesus was with was at Jerusalem for something, although we don't know what. And some of the people that later became his apostles were there. Peter and John were there. They didn't really know who Jesus was at the time. So we'll study that a little more when we get to John. But in any event, you can see people in white. And I'm told a lot of those people just come to get baptized on a regular basis. There may be some that that's their first time. But a lot of them are just getting dumped, if you will, because it's just a, a ritualistic thing they want to do. Now, I think that they charge you to be baptized there. I know they charge you if you want to use the restroom and change clothes because this is a privately run place and they want to charge you for everything. If you go online and look up this uh, yard of net, they have all the stuff they want to sell you. In any event, it's a pretty place. Water's maybe a little cleaner there than in the Jordan down by the Dead Sea, but I don't think it's the place that Jesus was baptized because it's actually in Galilee. But anyway, I took a few pictures just to show you. Now, we actually finished five minutes early, and I know you're surprised because the last two classes and this one, you expected me to do all the talk. <laughs> but I actually have some time now to ask you if you have questions about anything that we saw or about what's coming up. Next week, we're going to go to the Sea of Galilee, which, as I've said, that's probably my favorite place of all of them places we went on the trip is the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Do you know what year the drawing the astro the astrology stuff, what year that was done? I'm told that it was probably the second century AD. So it would have been a hundred years after Christ. And then that the church of transfiguration that you saw, what year was that built? Three hundred AD. There was a whole bunch of things that happened in 300, and I'll tell you why. I, I mentioned it before. But first of all, Constantine, for whatever reason, decided that he was going to become a Christian, probably because of the influence of his mother, because his mother was a Christian. And in 316, she said, I'm going to Jerusalem. And when she got to Jerusalem, the site where they believe Golgotha existed and where Jesus had been crucified and then buried had been covered over by uh, some type of uh, uh, ungodly temple. And it had been filled with ash and gravel. And she tore the temple down and she cleared out all the ash and gravel. And they found what they believe was the tomb Jesus uh, died in. And they built the church of the Holy Sepulchre there. And that was 316 A.D. She also went to uh, Bethlehem and built the church of, uh, what was it called? The church of Bethlehem where Jesus supposedly was born in the manger in that cave. And that was 316 also. And while I don't know this for sure, I may be speaking out of turn, I think she had something to do with this church built in Nazareth as well because it was built in the 300s. But that's when people were paying attention. The Roman government was not persecuting Christians any longer, although they had done so in the first and second centuries. They were now saying it's okay to be a Christian. And we're going to look in just a few weeks at Istanbul. And there's so many things about Istanbul. It used to be called Constantinople. That was after Constantine. And he made that his headquarters, moved Rome. Constantinople. And so Istanbul had a great influence too, and that'll be another class. Other questions? Yes, sir. The woman's case that you say you're going to tell us about, it wasn't just um, Jezebel. The woman's face. You show us a picture of a woman just now. You said you'll tell us which was. On, on a tapestry or mosaic. It was a mosaic or tapestry or something. Beautiful. I said I'd tell you who the woman was. The woman was. on the tile. Yeah. The woman on the oh, well, I don't know who that woman is, but you see her picture, and she's beautiful, and it looks like a photograph, meaning 
somebody was a good artist. But then when you got to the astrological thing, whoever drew that was a clown. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, they didn't know what they were doing. And we're going to look at other drawings that people did that were great. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's a caricature or something. But they were tiles, so it wasn't actually drawings. It was tiles. It's a mosaic on the floor. Well, it's it's still somebody. Mm -hmm. Somebody was the artist that put it on the tile. And so I just wanted to show the difference there. I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know the details of who she was or why she was there. Mm. Other questions? You probably have a bunch. You can always ask me by email or you can catch me uh, after class or in the foyer at church and ask other questions. But I hope you're getting something out of what we're seeing that you can apply spiritually. As I've entitled this, Renewal and Reinforcement, it renews. You're wanting to know more about what happened in the Bible. And so I hope you'll want to go back and study lots of things. And it reinforces things that you thought you knew. When we get to next week, there is something that I will tell you that just shocked me. Because it was so obvious about why it occurred where it occurred, and yet I'd never thought of it before. So I'm going to leave that with you and not tell you where it is. But it, that's, it's probably the most astounding thing of our 30-day trip was when, uh, when that happened. And that's going to be next week. So everybody come back next week. Yeah. Okay, we had about 24 people here. Ian, do you know how many people are online? Would you do a quick count there for me? Okay. If you'll just bow with me, we'll close with a prayer. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus to earth and he lived as a man. We're thankful that we can see many things about where he lived and what he did and better understand the scriptures that you've told us we should study so that we rightly divide the word. Help us to be students of the Bible. Help us to be scholars, but also help us to be messengers that take the gospel message to our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, and people in the community, because that's what we've been commanded to do.